Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to this session. Uh, let's continue uh, our discussion uh, on uh, financial crisis 2007-8 and further we let us also discuss um, the financial crisis in emerging market economies and other, other countries. So we have seen in the last session we discussed until here that means uh, in stage 2 uh, the subprime crisis led to the banking crisis and we have seen that we discussed uh, there was full fledged uh, financial crisis. So uh, you can see here that actually uh, Bear Stearns uh, the fifth largest investment bank, uh, fifth largest investment bank in the United States which had invested heavily in subprime related securities had a run on its repo funding and was forced to sell itself to JP Morgan for less than one tenth of its worth just a year earlier. In July, uh, you can also see that FENIMA, uh, Freddie Mac to privately owned but government sponsored enterprises that together insured over 5 trillion of mortgages were propped up by the US Treasury and the Federal Reserve for suffering substantial losses from their holdings of subprime securities. So, uh, both firms were put up into conservatorship uh, in September 2008. So another the which attracted the biggest that in news headlines that was in Monday September 15, 2008 uh, Lemon Brothers the fourth largest investment bank by asset size with over uh, 600 billion in assets filed for bankruptcy uh, making it largest bankruptcy in the US history. So the day before uh, Merrill Lynch, uh, the third largest investment bank uh, which had also suffered large losses on its holdings uh, of subprime mortgages, subprime securities uh, announced its sale to Bank of America for a price 60 percentage below its value a year later. So other the insurance companies AIG, they also suffered uh, extreme liquidity crisis. Uh, because when its credit rating was downgraded. So that means it had at that time it had written over uh, 400 billion of insurance contract that had to make payouts on possible losses from subprime mortgage securities. So here actually the Federal Reserve stepped in with a 85 billion loan to keep AIG afloat. That means we can see that too big to fail, too big to fail is actually that principle, principle that saying is actually taking place here. So there have been multiple other, several other uh, funding, mutual funds and several who have made an investment uh, in this uh, subprime mortgage, but mostly the investors, uh, investors, institutional investors, uh, you can see that most of them were uh, pension funds and uh, mutual funds, actually all these are funds from the general public. And then you know you know that uh, that all have been invested in the uh, mortgage and but by 2008 most of them began to suffer huge loss. So these firms you can see that these many firms all came came within a uh, of doing so and had to be rescued. So we can see that this is actually the uh, working of government safety net due to the government safety net all these firms were saved. So you know why this has been saved because government cannot allow uh, these uh, big firms, financial firms to fail because you know that if they fail uh, the entire financial system will fail when the, uh, it will adversely affect the uh, entire economy uh, even the recession is going to become uh, depression indeed. So that is the reason uh, government stepped in and they bailed out uh, rescued these firms, many firms were rescued. And however the FDIC closed you can see that there was several bank failure 465 banks failed banks from uh, 2008 to 2012. So that is the height of all these are the heights of the uh, stage 2 of that is the crisis, banking uh, crisis. So in this crisis we can see that the factors that we discussed in the previous classes, previous sessions all started a huge role in this crisis. So one is the conflict of interest. 
So let us see how different uh, stakeholders conflict of interest played a role. So coming to banks, retail banks, uh, banks wanted profits from selling the mortgages to investors uh, and cater to the rising demands. So what they did that because the retail bank we have seen that they sold out uh, these loans to investment banks, uh, investment banks in turn made into RMBS and CDOs and sold out to uh, investors, right? Uh, real estate investors, uh, mostly in institutional investors including mutual funds. They wanted to make huge profit and there have been huge demand for these products, their mortgages. Uh, so hence they started to loosen their standards and started out give out uh, subprime mortgages as, as much as possible that is with the banks so that means uh, what we have seen in previous sessions that means banks are expertise uh, in screening uh, screening of the customers and also that is in order to prevent adverse selection but what they did that uh, during 2000 after two in the year 2000 uh, because of the mortgage boom and because of the financial innovations so that means huge demand for mortgage loans the, this loans uh, actually there is huge demand from uh, investment bankers uh, they started to loosen their standards and give out uh, subprime loans and how about uh, credit rating uh, agencies so credit rating agencies what they did they are the, the big three rating agencies gave brilliant ratings to these securities and many of them were downgraded to junk status uh, in 2010. So credit rating agencies who rate the quality of debt securities in terms of the profit probability of default uh, were another contributor in this asymmetric information in the financial markets. So the rating agencies uh, we can see that they advise clients on how to structure uh, complex financial instruments uh, like CDOs. That is in one side because we have seen that conflict of interest here because credit rating agencies they have uh, both the ratings on the one side they have ratings and another side they have the uh, consultant for them. So they actually uh, help uh, many firms uh, to uh, structure complex financial instruments for example the CDOs, RMBS and CDOs. Uh, while the, at the same time uh, the same people, the same rating agency uh, they have been uh, rating uh, they, they, they are actually rating the same products as well. So that means same time they were rating these identical products. So the rating agencies were the subject to conflicts of interest uh, because the large fees they earn from uh, advising clients on how to structure uh, how to structure here the product development CDOs and all. Uh, so how to structure products that they themselves were rating meant that they did not have sufficient incentives to make sure. Uh, their ratings were accurate and you know many individual and institutional investors they were relying on these ratings and this rating we expect the in individual investors and institutional investors they will be expecting an unbiased ratings but what happened that uh, because of the conflict of interest you know that uh, it was the, it was a biased uh, ratings in fact it was a uh, biased ratings. Uh, bias ratings uh, were given uh, by these uh, rating agencies. So that means uh, the result was widely inflated ratings, uh, bias ratings that enabled the sale of complex financial products that were far riskier than investor recognized. Then coming to other agency problems, how about the mortgage brokers? Uh, th those who act between the mortgage, uh, the borrowers, the mortgage subprime mortgage borrowers uh, and the retail banks. So that originated the mortgage brokers who originated the mortgage loans often did not make a strong effort to evaluate whether the borrower could pay off the mortgage because since they plan to quickly sell uh, that means distribute the loans to investors in the form of uh, mortgage backed securities. So they do not have the strong effort, they did not put strong effort whether the borrower could pay off the loan uh, since uh, they could they would quickly sell uh, distribute the loans to investors in the form of uh, mortgage uh, backed securities. So this originate to distribute business model was exposed to the principal agent problem. So here uh, the mortgage back, uh, broker acted as agents for investors but did not have the investors best interest at heart. So once the mortgage brokers earn his or her fee what we can see because they are not worried about the quality of this mortgage. 
because anyway they are earning the fee of by selling this mortgage why should obviously we can ask why should the broker care if the borrower makes good on the payment so the more volume the bro uh, broker originates the more money the broker uh, makes here right so borrower the, 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 the about the borrowers part uh, we, there also we can see that they had little incentive to disclose uh, information about their ability to pay because for them they see that they are anyway uh, getting their credit score is less uh, very low still they are eligible for loan and they are seeing that the loan they are getting uh, in mortgage they also see that the prices has been prices have been increasing mortgage prices pri housing prices have been increasing in the market so they also feel that uh, making capital gain expected capital gain out of because of that they have uh, less incentive to disclose information about their their uh, ability to pay and about the agency problem again the commercial and investment banks which were earning large fees uh, buying underwriting mortgage backed securities and structured credit products uh, like cdos also had weak incentives to make sure that the ultimate holders of the securities uh, would be paid off so these people these stakeholders also have a uh, huge incentive to engage uh, in uh, that means uh, compromise their uh, ethical standards here Right, so they are also making la making large fees, and then accordingly they also and the conflict of interest, and they also didn't put much effort uh, while underwriting the mortgage backed securities and CDOs, and uh, because they didn't uh, clearly uh, really check the quality of the mortgage, the actual default risk of the mortgage, they did they are they were not much worried about that. So. All these uh, agencies that the commercial investment, commercial bank, investment banks, uh, they all had weak incentives to assess the quality of securities. Then coming the information asymmetry, uh, because of the financial uh, innovations, uh, the financial innovation uh, which led to uh, financial derivatives and that is the derivative that is the CDO, it was a derivative from uh, RMBS. So there was actually it is also called as securitization. So we can see the securitization brought new information asymmetries to financial markets because the complexity of the institution, sorry instruments, the complexity of the instruments and their lack of transparency made it difficult uh, for investors to evaluate uh, securitized uh, assets. And you know that they will be looking at the rating, credit rating of these products that they all see that uh, most products, uh, all these bonds, most of these uh, products are getting uh, high rating. So market based financial institutions like investment banks, uh, money market mutual funds and mortgage uh, brokers, all of them added to, added fuel to this information uh, asymmetry. So again we say that the information asymmetry, credit rating agencies who rate the quality of debt securities uh, in terms of the probability of default were another contributor to asymmetric information and aggravated uh, adverse selection problem. So as I just mentioned here that means the general public, the investors will be looking at the credit rating given by the rating agencies because they think that this will be unbiased rating uh, re truly reflecting the economic fundamentals but what they did that they also added to the information asymmetry uh, without uh, really checking in the quality of their asset quality of the debt instrument uh, they are rating so it also led to the issue of moral hazard problem before the financial crisis uh, financial institutions expected that regulating authorities would not allow them to fail due to the systemic risk. So this, this, this there was a presumption that some banks were so vital to the economy and they were considered too big to fail. And this, more, this too big to fail feeling it was so strong in the year 2000 that means they are all too big to fail and this actually promoted or encouraged the moral hazard problem. So they engaged in risky activities uh, even most uh, the um, retail banks they began to lend to the subprime uh, subprime borrowers and investment bank also did and inv the insurance company insured this and on the back of all this economic activity financial activity there was a feeling that if something goes wrong uh, government will save them that is federal insurance development corporation will pay off bail out the um, 
uh, retail banks that is the expectation from the banking sector uh, because they won't allow uh, the banking sector to fail and similarly investment banks insurance companies they all had these expectations so the given the liquidity provided by the collateralized debt market uh, lenders were able to relax their standards because all these loans are, were based on the collateral collateral here is the mortgage so lenders made risky lending decisions under the assumption that they would likely be able to avoid holding the debt through its uh, ender maturity so banks underwrote loans with the expectation that another party would likely to bear the risk of default and creating a moral hazard and eventually contributing to the mortgage crisis. So on the side of the government, we can see that government's various safety regulations in the banking sector, including deposit insurance, actually it was uh, aim was to reduce the chance of bank failure. But we know that uh, banks behavior, they started to take more risk than they did before. The government uh, guaranteed insurance uh, protects them from the losses that was their uh, uh, belief, belief from this banking sector and this actually reduced discipline in the banking sector. So in the one of the session we said that banks they are uh, expert in uh, ensuring screening and pro produce collecting private information and accordingly reducing the issue of the uh, reducing the moral hazard, uh, adverse selection and moral hazard. But uh, in 2000 we saw because of all these factors uh, it led to the moral hazard problem. So looking at this table you can compare for example the investment made the assets uh, by the banks in 2001 and 2006. So look at the real estate uh, investment by 2001 it was 20 percentage but it shot up to 33 percentage uh, in 2006. So finally, the government intervention happened uh, in 2008-9 period. So the bailout package was uh, debated. So you can see that uh, there is the debate was mainly between the Wall Street, uh, that the financial sector, and the Main Street, that the general public. House of Representatives watered down the uh, 700 billion bailout package, and you know immediately after that, the stock market further crashed after this decision, and because of that, uh, by October 3, 2008, finally the Wall Street won against the Main Street. Um, that means the taxpayers' money were used for uh, bailing out uh, the uh, Wall Street. The Main Street's money was used for uh, bailing out the, the general public to bailing out the Wall Street. So it authorized the Treasury to spend 700 billion in purchasing subprime mortgage assets from troubled financial institutions. And Congress approved uh, 7, 8, this much economic stimulus plan, stimulus plan on February 2009. So due to government and central bank intervention, the Great Recession was far smaller in magnitude than the Great Depression. So the height of 2007-8 crisis, the stock market uh, gathered pace in the fall of uh, 2008 uh, with the big beginning of uh, 2008. Uh, decline was uh, decline in uh, US history. So, uh, surging interest rate faced by borrowers led to sharp decline in consumer spending and investment. Unemployment rate shot up, uh, going over 10 percentage uh, in the level in the late 2009 during the Great Recession. So, let us now discuss the financial crisis in emerging market economies. Here what we are going to do that we will make a short uh, discussion about the framework that we discussed in the previous sessions. Here the mostly in the emerging market economies, the stage 1 uh, of the financial crisis was started with the credit boom and burst in the emerging market economies. So during you know in the mostly uh, because of the financial innovations. Uh, in the developed countries, uh, in the developed countries, western countries, it also led to uh, its uh, effects were also seen in the emerging market economies. So mostly emerging market economies means economies in an early stage of, uh, stage of market developments that were recently opened up to the flow of goods, services and capital from the rest of the world. These countries because of the, see the, the seeds of financial crisis in this economy are often sown. Uh, when a country liberalizes uh, its domestic financial systems uh, by eliminating uh, 
uh, restrictions on financial institutions and markets which is a process called uh, financial liberalization. So as a result what happened that when suddenly they opened up their because of the financial liberalization they actually most of the financial institutions banking institutions uh, they started uh, lending into new sectors uh, where they are actually not well trained or how well uh, expertise but that means weak supervision and lack of expertise they had uh, they, they, this is the uh, banking institutions in these economies were facing and which actually leads to uh, leads to a lending boom uh, in these countries. So, when they engaged in lending that means giving loans to even to subprime customers and obviously you know that um, it has to burst after, after a certain period of point of time. So, in this country you can also see that these domestic banks they borrow from the foreign banks they pump lots of money in their domestic market. Then in addition they also had the fixed exchange rate uh, this uh, has been giving them a sense of lower risk. That means that there is no exchange rate volatility so that they know that when they are borrowing from abroad they can pay back without any exchange rate uh, volatility. So, this also gave them a sense of lower risk. So, all this what they did that the banks in this uh, emerging market economies they started making uh, lots of lending uh, of a wide uh, large lending in the subprime market and however after certain period of time they have started experiencing the heat that means the default risk. So, another thing is that this is one that the stage one uh, in the stage two is that uh, these countries also experience severe fiscal imbalances. The fiscal imbalances in the form of uh, increasing fiscal deficit in this country uh, because of that governments in need of funds sometimes force banks to buy uh, government debt. So, they force governments force the banks to buy uh, government debt. Uh, that means when government debt loses value, uh, banks also lose and their net worth uh, decreases. There were some additional factors as well. Uh, that means the additional factors here is mainly increase in interest rates, especially abroad, uh, due to the factors uh, abroad. That means the precipitating factor in some crises was a rise in interest rate caused by events abroad, such as a tightening uh, of US monetary policy. For example, when the Fed is making a tightening of their monetary policy then you know that their the rate of interest increase in the US and this one will be further leading to increase in the interest rate in the emerging market economies as well. So, that means when the interest rate rise uh, high risk firms are more willing to pay the high interest rates. So, you can see that it leading to uh, adverse selection problem that right this problem is going to become uh, more severe uh, in these countries adverse selection problem is going to become uh, more severe. So, because of the interest rate the banking institutions are the, the, the who are by financial institution who are borrowing from the market uh, because of that the pay the payment the repayment burden the debt burden increases and because of that the asset price also decline. And in addition, it also led to the uh, also due to the uncertainty linked to the unstable political system uh, in the emerging market economies that also contributed. And these points are applicable to the low and middle income countries as well. So, in stage 2, we can also see the currency crisis that means deterioration of bank balance sheet uh, due to the currency crisis. The currency crisis here is that many uh, market participants uh, that means actually many people they make huge profits if they bet on depreciation of the currency of an emerging market economies. When uh, such a currency is fixed against another currency generally a currency of an advanced economy uh, the, the currency of the emerging market economies are often subject to uh, speculative attack that means speculators engage in mass sale uh, engage in large scale sa sales of this currency as a result their value depreciate and then it will lead to a currency crisis. What we have seen in previous session that uh, when there is a currency depreciation uh, then there is the, the de debt burden of the borrowing firms increases and it further leads to decline in the net worth of these firms. 
so let us see further uh, all these leads to a uh, stage 3 full fledged uh, financial crisis in uh, these countries so that uh, debt burden in terms of domestic currency increases they all these further lead to increase in expected and actual inflation which all further reduces the firm's cash flow so as a result you know that banks are more likely to fail uh, individuals are less able to fail, pay off their debts so because of the value of assets fall and debt denominated in foreign currency increases so the, that means uh, these firms banks value of liabilities uh, increases so this is the summary of the sequence of events in uh, emerging market economies financial crisis so you can see that that the increase in uncertainty asset price and increase in interest rate uh, all this uh, and deterioration in financial institutions balance sheet all this lead to uh, the problem of adverse selection and moral hazard then the fiscal imbalances uh, that the increasing fiscal deficit it also lead to uh, deterioration in the bank's balance sheet uh, and uh, this also leads to the uh, foreign exchange crisis all this lead to the worsening of the asymmetric information problem and as we have seen we can see here that it will lead to further that the decline in economic activity and it will further leading to banking crisis and finally the adverse selection problems becoming even further more and more worse and you can also see that all these lead to shrinking of economic activity economic activity declines and economy is falling into uh, recessions so in this session and last session what we have done is uh, we have discussed the financial crisis uh, of um, in 2007-8 and also uh, applied also discuss this one with the related to the financial crisis or in some emerging market economies we didn't discuss the financial crisis in emerging market economies in detail uh, you can see that there are crisis in many countries for example you can look into south korea you can look into argentina uh, and other countries uh, turkey etc uh, but we, we, that actually you can apply all these principles there and I am sure that now you will be you are in a better position to understand um, uh, the economics behind the financial crisis in many countries including uh, low and middle income countries as well. Um, uh, let me stop here um, thank you very much.